Welcome, welcome. Great. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming here physically, and hello to those of you that are joining us on YouTube Live as well. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about behind the scenes, what happens when they manufacture jewelry. So we're going to be talking about the lost wax casting process, and we're also going to be sharing a little more about the sort of traditional jewelry manufacturing process, so you can understand where lost wax casting fits into this entire um, set of things that we do in the factory. This is one of the sessions that's run uh, by Tanya and myself. Tanya is the founder of the Jewelry Design and Management International School, and I'm, I'm one of the, uh, the directors. Um, both of us are presenting different topics uh, in these uh, series of sessions for the National Design Center, and uh, we are very excited to have all these different varieties of things to talk about. We have different gem spotlights if you want to know more about specific gemstones. Uh, we have focuses on designing and manufacturing so that you understand more about how jewelry is made. And then we also have some interesting topics, things like how to care for your jewelry uh, and also things like buying natural diamonds versus synthetic diamonds, sort of topical things that are interesting for people that are uh, looking at or in the jewelry industry. But I'd like to share with you before we go any further, I'd like to share with you a little more about who we are here at JDMIS. And to do that, I have a two minute video that just explains about our school. And from there, we will jump straight into the presentation. Since 2007, the Jewelry Design and Management International School has given thousands of people the confidence to create quality jewelry. Established in Singapore, in the heart of Southeast Asia, JDMIS has conducted courses for some of the world's most distinguished jewelry companies, as well as passionate amateurs and those ready for a career in the jewelry industry. Specializing in the jewelry arts, JDMIS provides exceptional education in jewelry design, fabrication, gemology, and business. The tools that students receive from JDMIS on their first day have traveled with many along the road of jewelry making success. Tanya Seydow, founder of the JDMIS, is an award-winning jewelry designer and renowned jewelry educator with over 30 years of experience training the jewelry industry. Tanya, with her team of expert jewelry artists and instructors, created the JDMIS curriculum to be comprehensive yet flexible. Small class sizes, personalized attention, and an unmatched support network ensure that each participant leaves with the knowledge, skill, and confidence to succeed in the jewelry industry. Designed for the jewelry trade, training at JDMIS is fast-paced and packed with useful practical information. But with a diverse range of participants, courses are also great fun. Learning at their own pace, participants study the latest information about gemstones and jewelry styles. They gain confidence using the best of traditional and contemporary techniques and learn how to apply each of these skills to their businesses. All JDMIS courses are completely modular and they can be taken individually. For each skill they learn, students receive a certificate and can combine these skills to receive a comprehensive diploma qualification. Graduates in more than 42 countries delight friends and relatives with their unique creations. Many graduates showcase their pieces online and JDMAS's brightest stars operate their own successful retail jewelry businesses, designing and producing exquisite jewelry that enchants their customers. The possibilities are endless. What will you create? Okay, are we back? Excellent, so today we're gonna to be talking about how jewelry design concepts are transformed into the pieces of metal that we can wear. Uh, 
because a lot of times people that are wearing these beautiful things don't imagine what effort take, it takes to actually produce the pieces. In fact, most of the time what we have in our minds is maybe something from sort of history where we imagine sort of people working in old style factories, uh, maybe using very small tools that they're focusing on or maybe using uh, you know, big machines with fire and things like that. And it's interesting for people to see what these technologies actually really look like today. And what's most interesting is that the technologies aren't much different. We still work on very small machines in very small spaces. Uh, we still do a lot of handwork. Uh, we still have fire. We don't have very much that's changed. Um, and we wanted to share a little bit about sort of where some of these technologies fit in and how we can, uh, how and when we use casting to make particular pieces of jewelry. So first of all, I wanted to talk about, before we go into casting, how a typical piece of jewelry might be made using hand fabrication. Hand fabrication means making the thing using your hands and some tools. So the tools you might have usually would be hand tools, things like hammers and saws and tools that you can use to drill things, perhaps. All of these things can be used to produce a piece of jewelry. And so typically what a jeweler will do is they will start by melting their metal and they will pour the metal into a little container that's going to create an ingot for them. And that's basically just a little block of metal that's a reasonable size that they can then go ahead and turn into something more exciting. So you can see here we're pouring the ingot into uh, the mold and then we take the ingot out and we run it through a rolling mill in order to be able to flatten it to get exactly the thickness that we're looking for. Once we have the thickness, we can take our design and trace it or stick it onto the piece of metal and then cut out the parts that we're looking for. And if we need to shape those parts, we might use other pieces of metal um, to shape those pieces. They're called daps, and you can kind of make different shapes by hammering the metal into those particular shapes. Then you can take parts of metal that are separate and you can join them together using soldering techniques Soldering is basically using another metal, uh, a different alloy that melts at a slightly lower temperature so that you can combine pieces together without melting your entire piece. And so here you can see we're hammering the shape together, we're soldering the base portion of the ring, then we're going to have to do some more cutting and filing uh, to make everything fit. We're going, to saw, uh, we're going to solder and saw a top surface for the ring, and eventually we're going to be able to produce an entire ring that looks quite three-dimensional, but we made it from pieces of flat metal, right? And you can see here, the ring is coming to its conclusion. It's all being filed and polished now. And you can almost see, you can see the shape of the ring. It's actually a signet ring. And you can see how it really started from some flat pieces of metal. And you can now create something quite rounded and quite interesting. Now that's very interesting, and this technique is very time consuming because you really are starting from nothing, right? You're having to roll out every piece and saw out every piece and hammer every shape and do all of those things. Not only is it time consuming, but it is more suitable for things that can be made with flat pieces of metal or wire. Anything that starts with a flat piece of metal is very well suited to this type of design. You can see a couple of examples on the, uh, on the screen there. But what it's not suitable for is when you're making things that are very organic shaped, flowing, that have carving elements to them. This is difficult to do using hand crafting techniques. And why is that? Well, because it's very difficult for me to start with a flat piece of metal and get something that looks like this. And so what we need to do is we need to adopt a different method of manufacturing if we want to make these types of things. And that different method of manufacturing is also applicable whenever we're working with harder metals. Because when you think of a goldsmith, a goldsmith has the luxury of working with gold. Gold is very soft and very easy to work with. The goldsmith will get a headache if you tell him that you want to make something in platinum. Because platinum is much harder than gold, much harder to work with, much harder to polish, much harder to file, much harder to solder. Everything is more difficult. And so when you're working with harder metals, 
there are other ways that are easier where you can simply melt the metal, pour it into the shape you want, and you can save yourself all of the trouble of having to hammer and saw and solder. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is instead of working with the metal directly, we work with something soft. We work with wax. And what we can do is we can take a block of wax and we can carve out the shapes of those wax elements and into the block of wax until we have something that looks exactly like what we want. And then we can convert the wax into a metal. That conversion process of wax to metal is what we call lost wax casting. And that's the big part of what we're going to be talking about today. But a lot of people don't understand why we're talking about wax when we're doing casting. It's an important part of the jewelry industry, but there's a, a significant piece that comes before, which is the working with the waxes. So let's see what we have to do in order to get these things to work. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to think about making the wax. So the wax carving typically is done by a different kind of specialist in the workshop than the jewelry manufacturing side of things. So if you go into a big workshop, the people that are doing the wax carving normally specialize and only do wax carving. And the people that are doing the bench work where they're hammering and sawing and soldering and setting gemstones, they only deal with the metals. You can find people that do both, but in a big shop, you'll find that there's specialized uh, techniques. And so what do they do? They take blocks of wax, like you see on the screen here. And sometimes there are even tubes of wax that are already the same shape as kind of a ring shape, for example. And they take tools like this little machine here, which have a, a pen at the end, which gets really, really hot so they can melt the wax. Or they take tools like this, which are basically like dental tools that allow them to carve away elements. And they simply create the shapes that they're looking for. They need to do it very accurately. They'll measure gemstones, they'll place the gemstones, and they'll cut away the shapes and the sizes that they need in order for everything to fit perfectly uh, when they're ready to make the piece in metal. And I wanted to just go through the process, but I also wanted to show you a quick video of how this process works. You can see here, these are some of the steps involved. You can see that we start from the block, and then we cut away and cut away and cut away until we get closer and closer and closer to our finished design. And this process takes a lot of time. So you can see more steps, more steps still, eventually to the point where we get to our finished design. This process is a process that requires real accuracy. It's not a rough ga gauge. We need to get it exactly how it's going to be because we can afford to make a mistake in wax. We can't afford to make the mistake once we've converted it into gold or platinum. And you'll see here the wax carver is using sharp tools and is using very careful movements to be able to get all of these shapes exactly right. They're drilling holes, they're rounding surfaces, they're carving and marking surfaces so that they know what to work with. And you can see it's a really, really fine level of detail that they're applying to these designs. Not only that, but if they ever, what you've been seeing up until now is cutting away. Now what you're seeing is the jeweler actually adding. So the jeweler can melt wax and add little drops of wax to create extra surfaces. And then those extra surfaces are a great example, for example, prongs that are going to hold the gemstones in place. Now it's not just cutting away waxes, you can even work with soft waxes. So this is a great example of working with some soft wax materials. And the soft wax materials are so soft that you can literally carve them with a cutting knife. And then you can still file them and you can still do some limited amount of work to fine tune these uh, pieces. You can bend them, you can manipulate things very easily, welcome. And uh, eventually, once you've got your wax piece, in this case, obviously, we wouldn't cast it with the stone in place, so we would remove the stone as well. But all of these are great examples of how the wax pieces are produced. So now that we've got the wax piece, what happens next? Well, typically, somebody has to check it. Because again, we're going to transfer, transform this into metal. The metal is expensive. We don't want to make a mistake. And so in a bigger factory, you'll usually have the person that's in charge will check, will double check the measurements, will double check the sizes of the gemstones, make sure that everything fits so that now is the time we fix the problems. 
If it looks good, then they will take it on to the next step, which is to create a mold for this piece. And then they will melt metal, pour it into the mold, and to create the metal piece of their design. So how does this work? Well, I'd like to explain it to you in three different ways, because sometimes if you just see it once, it kind of just all goes over your head. Um, so I'm going to show you once in very simple diagram format. Then I'm going to show you once in pictures so that you know what to look for. And then we're going to watch the process in an actual video so that you can recognize what things are happening at what stages. So here I have a wax ring that I want to make into a piece of metal. The first thing I'm going to do to this wax ring is I am going to add a sprue. The sprue is the piece that is at the bottom there, that funny looking triangular shape at the base. And just stick with me for the moment. We're going to have to add it. I'm not going to tell you why. You'll see why once we've gotten into the next step, stage. So once I've added the sprue, and this is a piece of wax, I will put the wax into a flask. And you can see the walls of the flask. This is actually a circular flask that is holding that wax piece inside. Once I've got my flask in place, I will fill the flask with a liquid called an investment. And this is actually a very, very fine powder that's been mixed with water and been poured into the flask and then allowed to dry. When this dries, this will become very hard and will trap all of the fine detail, all of the different elements that have been designed on the piece of wax because of the very fine powder that it's made up of. So then we take this piece and we put it, we, we take this flask and we put it into an oven and we have the oven melt out the wax. So you can see now that I have an empty space, a hollow space inside the investment powder, in, inside the investment uh, area, where the shape of the design is left over, but the wax is now melted out. Then I turn the flask upside down. And you can see now why the sprue was important. Do you see how I made a little V shape like a funnel at the top? And I also have a little metal flow channel to help make a space for me to get metal into the, the ring design. That's what the sprue was for. So now what I can do is I can melt my metal and I can pour my metal into the mold. And then I can let the metal dry, met, let, met, let the metal cool so that it becomes um, solid. Once the metal is solid, I need to remove the investment, which is called divesting. So I remove that investment material. And then I cut off the sprue. And then I polish the piece. And I'm left with my finished, wax, uh, finished metal design, exactly the shape of the wax original. Make sense? OK, let's see what that looks like in terms of real objects. Here's an example of a single piece that I'm putting onto a wax sprue. You can see the flow channels down here. And over there, there is an example of a multiple sets of things that we've added onto a, a wax tree. So you can cast many things, or you can cast just one thing. The burnout process that we were talking about, where you have to create the investment, and then you have to go through that process. This is a flask. This is the flask filled with the investment powder. The wax is trapped inside there, right? Because we put the waxes in, we poured the investment powder on top. And then we have to put it in an oven to melt out the wax. Then we melt our metals. And how do we melt metal? Well, there are a few different ways that we can melt metals. One easy way is we can just use something to melt the metal. We can use fire, or we can use a furnace. Um, and then we can literally just pour the molten metal into the mold. This is a great example of what's good enough for making like an ingot mold. An ingot mold is just a block right? that you would then hammer or roll into the shape that you want. This is great, but the thing is, it's not very high tech. And if I don't pour it properly, it might not get into all of the areas. And if I have a lot of very fine detail, if I'm making a very small design, just pouring the metal maybe isn't going to get into all of the corners of a very detailed piece. So there is a slightly more advanced way that I can do this. And that one is called centrifugal casting. 
And you can see the metal is in the middle there being um, uh, melted. And then once the metal is molten, I can spin around the flask and I can use centrifugal force to push the metal out into the flask so that it really gets into all of the corners and really fills the space nicely. So that's pretty useful to know that there's this additional technology that lets me get a little bit more detailed. But there's even more ways that we can do it. What you will see in a lot of jewelry companies is they will use vacuum casting. And what does vacuum casting do? Well, in the machine underneath this thing, there is a vacuum pump and it's sucking air out through the flask. So I don't know if you noticed in the pictures of the flasks that we had earlier, they were actually, they had holes in them. And that's because you need to be able to suck the air through the metal holes so that you, when you pour the metal in, the vacuum underneath this is making sure that any little tiny drop, droplets of air, droplets, any bubbles of air uh, are being sucked through the porous uh, investment powder and are making sure that you have a really good quality cast. And if you want to go even a step further, you can use machines like this one, which have computers to control the heating to make sure that you don't overheat the metal and then cause uh, problems with elements of your alloy separating. Uh, you've also got a large chamber that you can seal so that you can remove all of the air and make sure that everything is nice and without any air, so you don't need to worry about that. You can see the metal is molten in there, and then eventually you simply pour the metal into your flask, which sits in the corner here, and the machine also vibrates while you're pouring it to make sure that you have the detail going into the, the metal going into every small detail of your mold. So there are even big machines that do this on an industrial scale. This machine is taller than I am, and it's a continuous casting machine, which means you keep putting gold in the top, and it keeps melting the gold, and down at the bottom either comes a continuous wire of gold, or if you've got multiple things to cast, you can put one uh, flask, and then another flask, and then another flask, and these things can just keep running and running and running. So this type of technology is something that we see in a lot of factories, and there's a lot of different ways it can happen. What I wanted to do was to show you a video of what you would typically find in a smaller factory, but maybe with a bit higher tech equipment. This is an example right from beginning to end. So we take the wax pieces, we put them onto the wax tree. We've got the sprue at the bottom there. And once we've got those pieces on the wax tree, what we're going to do is we're going to weigh the wax because we need to know how much gold do we need to go out and buy. So we weigh the, gold, the wax, we convert it to gold so that we can know how much gold we need, and then we put the flask onto the wax that we're going to cast. Then we need to mix up our investment powder. You can see here this is the powder. Now we're going to mix in with it the water. And how do we mix it? Well, if you go into some old factories, you'll find an old uncle with a, a mixing bowl, and he'll use his hand to mix it up as if you were making pancakes. Um, that's not usually a great option because you don't get a very smooth mixture, and you get lots of air bubbles. So if you do this in a more uh, modern factory, typically you'll find a machine like this that is a combination of a mixer and a vacuum machine. So we add in, yes? Yeah. So we're applying a vacuum now, and as we apply the vacuum, what we're then doing is starting the mixer to get a nice, good, consistent uh, mix. Then once this is nicely mixed, we are going to pour the investment into the flask. So we're going to give it a couple of minutes to mix nicely, and then after that's finished, we simply open the base of this, and we allow the investment mix to pour into the flask. And you'll see it coming through there. You'll notice it looks very liquid. And also, you will notice that as it is flowing, it's really going around all of the corners. It's picking up all of the detail on the wax pieces. Now we need to let this dry. The drying process, if I'm working with gold or silver, will typically take three or four hours. 
If I'm working with platinum, I need to wait at least 24 hours for it to dry. So I fast forward 3 to 24 hours, and if I remove the base now, you will see that the wax is trapped inside. Do you see the little blue dot? The wax is actually inside that mold. So I need to remove the wax in order to be able to do my casting. This is why we call it lost wax casting. This is the lost part. So what I do is I put it in an oven, and this is a particularly interesting step because it is very much an art form. Uh, a lot of people, they have very specific ideas as to what the right way to burn out their waxes. And there are a few different things that you need to think about because if I put something in a hot oven, what's going to happen to it? It's going to expand, right? That's what happens to things when they get hot. If I put wax in a, an oven and it expands, it's going to break the mold. So I can't put it into a very hot oven. I have to slowly heat it up so that the wax can melt out and I don't run the risk of damaging my mold. But if I put the temperature too high, then, sorry, if I put the temperature too low, the wax isn't going to come out. So I have to then raise the temperature much higher at the end to make sure all of the wax burns out and I have no chance of any leftover wax in the piece. What you saw me doing here was basically just loading the alloy into the flask at the bottom that we're going to use to heat this and setting the melting temperature. Now in this case we were casting um, 925 silver which has a melting temperature of 960 degrees. We're, getting, we're heating it up now and what happens here is that once we have done our burnout cycle, now this burnout cycle can take 8 to 12 hours, it's not fast. We take it straight out of the oven, put it into the casting machine. This is like 700 degrees, it has to be hot. And then we seal up our casting machine and we start the process to melt the metal. When we're melting the metal, we have to not only get the metal to melting point, which makes it go from solid to liquid, but we need to go beyond the melting point. Because as I pour the metal, it's going to cool as it's pouring out of the heated uh, crucible, and it's going to freeze. So when it freezes, it gets hard. So I need to go to molten, which is 960 degrees for 925 silver. You can see it's now bubbling. But I need to go beyond that, so that when I pour it out, it's going to stay hot enough that it's going to stay liquid. So I'm going to keep going until I get up to 980 degrees, about 20 degrees more, so that then when I pour it into the flask, which is only at 700 degrees, the change in temperature isn't going to immediately cause the metal to freeze. Now that it's at 980 degrees, I simply tilt the casting machine, and you can see the metal poured into the mold. And at this point, the metal is using high pressure to push, the machine is using high pressure to push the metal into the flask and at the same time the machine is shaking the flask using little micro vibrations to get the metal into all of the small areas of the design that I'm working with. Then we have to wait about 10-15 minutes for the metal to cool enough that we can take it out and it's still super hot, it's probably still about 600 odd degrees. What we now do is divest, remove the investment. And how do we do that? Well, if I'm working with gold and silver, it's very easy. I just throw it in a bucket of water. Why? Because it's hot and the investment powder is water soluble, hot water, lots of bubbling, lots of movement, and it'll basically dissolve the investment powder again. And I'm left with my metal pieces. So sometimes there might be leftover investment powder that I didn't get off and you can use a sandblaster to remove that if you want to do it very quickly or if you've got more time you can use a toothbrush and you can slowly remove that material that way. But you can see I now have my material finished. I'd like you to look at this and I'd like you to notice the color of it. Does it look like what we normally think of as colorful shiny metal? Not quite, right? So there's a, another step that I need to do to this to make it finished. So after casting, then typically the metalsmith still has to do some hand work. It's not like I have this magic machine where I press a button and then out comes the jewelry piece ready to wear. In fact, the jeweler is going to have to take the piece that looks like this on the left. They will have to cut away the sprue and the metal flow channels. And they will need to do some initial polishing to get it to the point where they can do some next steps. At that point, they will do, well, the polishing to be able to start 
the next stage of working. And what does the polishing mean? Well, typically, I want to get from this to something that looks shiny, and I have lots of steps to do. These are all sandpaper and all different grits of sandpaper. And you can see that you need to apply the sandpaper again and again and again with finer and finer and finer grits until you have something that's nicely polished. Once you've done the heavy work with the sandpaper, then you can use polishing wheels and you can take uh, polishing compounds that you apply onto the wheels. That's what this little brick is that the guy's using. Um, and those polishing compounds also have different grits and different, um, uh, different levels of polish. And each time you use one, you're going to use a different wheel. And also you have different shaped wheels for polishing different parts of the design. So you can see that this is quite an involved process. It's never going to be just like, oh, polish. Polishing is a really long process. Once you've polished, then you need to set the gemstones. And how do you set the gemstones? Well, there's a lot of ways to set the gemstones. Some easy ways, you can set the prongs. That involves not too much work. You can maybe do some setting with a bezel that has a band of metal around the outside. Also not too much work. But if you have lots of tiny little gemstones, then the setting becomes a much more complicated process. And so typically what a jeweler will do is they will have to manually make sure that all of the holes are the right size, manually place the gemstones into the shapes that have been cast, and then manually adjust all of the little prongs to make sure they're all held in place properly. This isn't an automated process. Um, this is very much a skilled um, labor that needs to be part of the overall process. And when you've done all of your setting, then obviously you need to do more polishing. Because as a result of doing all the setting, you're scratching your surface, and you need to polish up that surface again to get more and more refined designs. So we've got a couple of uh, more elements here, two last little gemstones to put in place, and then we would have another round of polishing. Now, typically, if you're making one-of-a-kind pieces, one-of-a-kind pieces, you just polish it, you hand it to your customer, you take the money. Um, that's it. However, if you're working in an environment where you might want to make many copies, you might want to make two copies, keep one just for backup in case you ever want to reference that design, or maybe you want to make 2,000 copies because you're trying to sell them in many different markets in many different countries, the process for making copies requires the use of a rubber mold. And so typically, what we would do is we would take the first piece that we cast, and we would place it with something that looks a bit like a sprue onto a rubber mat. And we actually buy lots of little rubber sheets. You can see them all in the corner there. And we lay one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, so that they kind of surround the piece, and then we put them in a vulcanizing machine. And the vulcanizing machine applies pressure on those rubber sheets so as to fuse them all together and create a single rubber block around the piece of metal. It also uses heat to make sure that the rubber melts and goes into all of the corners and picks up all of the detail on the uh, jewelry pieces. And then we cut out the original metal piece, and we are left with a shape that is another kind of mold, but this time the mold is made in rubber, not investment. Then we take this mold and we use a wax injector to shoot more wax into that little rubber mold. And then we, you can see the wax piece in the corner there that is ready for us to mass produce. And then if we're mass producing this a thousand times, we would then make a thousand little tiny pieces of wax. So we shoot wax into it a thousand times and then we want to turn these into a thousand pieces of metal, we have to put them onto a wax tree, same way you saw before. Instead of one thing, we're going to put many, 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 many things onto the wax tree. Once we've got our wax tree, then we go through the same process you saw before. So we put it into the flask. You'll notice this one is the flask for the vacuum casting because it has the holes around the outside. Uh, you can see the pieces there in the flask ready for me to put my investment. After I've done that, what I will do is mix up my investment 
in maybe this case I have the old uncle style where I'm just using a, a cake mixer. Um, but you can mix up the investment, you pour the investment into the flasks, you allow the flasks to dry, you then do the burnout process the same way we learned. Then you melt your metal, you pour your metal into the flask, and you do your casting. Then you devest the casting, and you have your finished piece. You cut all of the little finished pieces off the metal sprue, and you're left with all of this individual pieces of metal that you were trying to mass produce. So hopefully now you've seen this same process in a few different ways, so you have a little bit better of an understanding of how this works in different, um, using different types of techniques. Now there's one thing I wanted to mention. If you are working with uh, waxes, then you've got to get very good at carving waxes and doing all of the work that needs to be done with waxes. But there is an alternative to working with waxes, and that's working with computers. So we can actually use computer-aided design to create a 3D model. We can send the 3D model to a machine. In this case, the machine is a CNC machine that can actually cut out the wax using a drill, a drill bit. And those can get really good results. Or I can send it to a 3D printer that can print waxes. Uh, in this case, I can use a um, multi-jet modeling printer that can produce waxes. You see the blue wax is the actual design that I'm producing. The red wax is just what's supporting it so it doesn't melt. And I can even use tools like uh, this one, tools like this one that will allow me to produce uh, a resin piece. But the resin is like a wax-like resin so I can still cast the resin. But all of these three different technologies can produce a piece that can basically replace the wax carver that's going to cut out the piece manually. And then I can take those wax pieces and I can simply send them to the casting company and have them produce the piece in metal. So that's an interesting change in technology that doesn't really remove the wax carver, but it means that I don't need a wax carver in order to do certain types of designs. So hopefully that's clear. You've got a little bit of a better understanding of um, lost wax casting in general. Um, if you have any questions, or if we have any questions from people online, um, then happy to answer. Yes? OK, question is, are there different types of waxes? Uh, there are lots of different types of waxes. When you saw the different videos that we were going through, you saw blue waxes, and pink waxes, and green waxes. And then you saw purple wax in the end with the computer. So usually the colors have to do with like the hardness of the wax. Some are more useful for filing and sewing. Some are more useful for bending and molding. Um, there are also, if you're working with the 3D printers, uh, the 3D printers uh, have wax-like resins, but they're not really waxes. And so they are different from waxes. And what that means is that when you go casting, you will have to tell your casting company what wax or resin you're using because there are different processes for each one of them. So yes, there are lots of different types of waxes. Great. Yes, please. So it depends on the 3D printer. You can get really good 3D printers now where the um, the the artifacts that you see, because of the fact that it's building layer by layer, are very minimal. Um, you can also, because some of these are producing wax-like pieces, you can do a post-treatment to them. So you can actually dip them in a liquid that will kind of roughen or, or kind of dull the edges a little bit. But it doesn't do too much work to dull the edges. It just sort of dulls the little steps that you see. Um, if you're working with wax, you can actually also use chemicals to further help you uh, smooth off the surfaces, like a solvent type chemical. Um, so you can basically do good work with them, even if the printer is not the most high resolution printer. Great. How or where would we learn how to do wax carving and casting? OK, we had a question on YouTube to say uh, where to learn. Well, typically, this is something that's kind of hard to learn. 
um, because you've got to go to an environment where you'll have the equipment to be able to do it. So typically, that's a factory or a school environment that's going to have the tools and the equipment. Um, it's possible to do this at home, but there are a few things to be careful of. I think Tanya mentioned something uh, when she was talking about my example of sort of mixing something in, your, in a bowl. Uh, a lot of the things that you're working with are perhaps things that you need to be careful of from a safety perspective. I mean, melting metals, uh, that requires some safety considerations. Uh, if you have a centrifugal casting machine where you're melting metal and then spinning it around as fast as you can, there's a possibility that you know you've got to be extra careful about how you're uh, you know properly bracing your equipment and making sure that you're you have proper um, safety precautions in place. Um, but nowadays the better technologies are really really easy to use too. So some of the ones that you saw the vacuum machines, you don't need to be a super expert to be able to do that. Um, but you might need some more in the way of equipment. So probably the best thing is to go to either a casting company and ask them if they will be able to do some training, or go to a school, ask them if they'll be able to do some training, or go to a factory that's uh, maybe looking to train up uh, a, um, you know, have somebody as an apprentice. Uh, that's a great way to get into this particular side of the industry, because it's pretty hard to do on your own. The equipment itself, I mean, a, a centrifugal casting machine you can buy from anywhere from $800 to $3,000. Uh, if you want a proper casting machine that does vacuum and maybe with a sealed chamber that's a bit safer, uh, then you're looking at 30, 20, 30, 40,000 US dollars. So it gets expensive pretty quickly. Uh, not maybe something you'd want to do just, you know, what am I going to do this weekend? Let's learn casting. So can I just um, uh, add something to that? Alex? Yes. Um, we have. Uh, different programs here. Of course, when Alex said, well, just go to a school. I mean, there aren't that many schools in Singapore that will do casting. Um, we have it in our program, but it is not the most popular one to do because there is an easier way to do it. And the easier way to do it is to use the new technology, which is called the powder metallurgy. Because if I want to do the same kind of shape, the sculptural, the thing that I can carve, etc., today we can take powdered metal, we can carve it all you like, and then we can fire it on our gas stove. We don't even need all the expensive equipment. So why do something that requires the factory and the casting machine and people to take your wax, and who knows whether they're going to copy it because they have the perfect opportunity to copy your design if they want to. Um, so why let it out of your hands and do it that way? When today we can get the same job done in a slightly easier way. So that one is what we call new metals. And the new metals is uh, it's available. We do have it. Uh, we will be starting new metals programs very shortly. We actually do a little bit of the uh, carving and the making of the uh, the sprues and attaching all of the um, waxes onto the trees and doing a little bit of casting uh, in later programs like the 300 to 400 series. So those are also going to come up, but it's not likely to be this year. It's likely to be next year. All right, just to let you know. Great. And uh, Firem, who was asking where and uh, how, uh, if you're in Singapore, uh, then the casting program is one that we are used to do in our old location. We don't do it in this location also because of the uh, requirements of being in a, a central location and the fire and safety requirements. Um, but that's something we're also coordinating with the industry partner that now has the equipment that we had in our old location. Uh, so there are lots of ways to do that um, if that's something that's, uh, that's of interest. Right, and we had one other question, which Tanya, I don't know um, how to answer this. Are there any other unusual prerequisites to become an apprentice? Uh, well, if you're going to be an apprentice in jewelry, unfortunately, the prerequisites are accuracy, precision, and detail. You have to love those words. If you don't love those words, then it might not be the kind of thing for you because you're working with very tiny little things. And the smaller something is, the more precise you have to be because if you're off by half a millimeter, everybody can see it. 
I mean, if we're working on very large things and you're off by half a millimeter, nobody could care less. Nobody's going to notice, right? But when it comes to jewelry, unfortunately, we can't have very big things because our gold is very expensive. And, you know, even silver today, if you're going to do something big, could be an expensive venture. And then you're putting the nice gemstones with it, etc. So expensive things tend to be smaller. And the smaller they need, the smaller they are, the more precise you have to be. So, what would it take? It would take somebody that's got a lot of desire to actually do it and do it really well. Yeah. Great. Yes. So usually we will work with expensive gemstones, right? But using the hand carving method would we necessarily use the gemstones while we're making the wax um, carving? Yeah, I don't see. I don't see why not. Um, you you can. Um, there was one. Uh, there was one little picture that Alex had with the blue wax that they were carving out the shapes for the pear-shaped pear gemstones. I don't know if you noticed it. They had some little pink uh, pear-shaped gemstones, and so we can prepare everything before casting. We can prepare the seats. We can prepare. We can build up the wax for the um, even for the prongs and everything like that. It can be definitely done. Um, should we cast the gemstones in place only if you have certain gemstones? I mean, diamonds can take heat usually, and you have to be very particular even with diamonds because you can't cool it down very fast. But um, other gemstones are not very good with heat, and it would be in some cases dangerous to to set them and cast in place. If you're working with synthetic gems, no problem at all. Synthetic gems are usually uh, tried and tested because they're coming out of a lab, they're using the heat. They don't have so many uh, inclusions maybe, and you know, it's when you have a natural stone with natural inclusions, and the problem with the inclusions is, is that when you heat something up, those inclusions could expand, they can contract, and that could cause all kinds of uh, difficulty. And a lot of gems today are treated. And so if your gemstones are treated and you heat them, that can burn off all the treatment. I mean, you could go in with one color, it'll come out another color. And even some gems, when you heat them, even if they're not treated, they might even change color. So it's not something I would recommend unless you really know what gemstone you're going to use that you know that that gemstone is okay with the heating. Um, so that being said, we can cast the metal and then we can set the stones afterwards. There's no issue whatsoever. Yeah. For a small business to do casting? You'll need, so the question is, what machines are essential for a small business to do casting? Um, you'll need uh, an oven to do your burnout. It needs to be programmable so you can have different stages of your uh, uh, of temperatures and different times. You'll need, the actual, um, you'll need the actual casting machine, which could be a combination machine that melts the metal and uh, also allows you to pour the metal and has vacuum in it. Uh, but uh, sometimes you might have a, a separate machine. You'd have one machine to do your melting, and you'd have another machine just to hold the, the flask and pour the flask. Like the um, one that you showed like on, the, one that we on had. the screen. Yep. Yeah. Um, you would need uh, something cheap. to mix your investment. Uh, you would need, uh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to think about. It's, it really isn't that straightforward. So for example, Tanya said, uh, from a safety perspective, when you're doing the investment, the investment powder, the better quality casting you want, the finer powder you need, the finer the powder, the more it's gonna be harmful for you if it gets into your lungs. So you need proper uh, kind of N95 or better masks. Um, that investment powder, when you devest and you wanna get rid of it, you don't just pour it down the sink. If you pour it down the sink, it is gonna harden in your pipes and then you will have to call plumbers and have to hack uh, your pipes up. So usually you need a special system that lets you uh, precipitate out the powder uh, before it gets, before the water goes into the, the sewage system. Uh, then for the casting equipment, if you're using fire, you need to make sure you've got good uh, ventilation. Uh, if you're using an electrical system, then you've got to make sure you've got good cooling because the electrical systems that heat 
the metals. Typically, they need to be cooled down. Otherwise, the metal parts that heat will melt themselves, and then you have a problem. So there's quite a few different elements that you need to think about. And probably a good idea is to go to one of the big uh, suppliers, uh, somebody like Rio or Stuller, uh, or a, a big company in your local uh, market that deals with this type of equipment, and have them recommend a series of things, because they will know what goes well together and what, to, um, what, what you need for your particular location. And it depends really how much you're going to produce, because if you're only going to produce one or two items, then it's just not worth going to all that trouble. You might as well go and find the person who will do the casting for you for fifty dollars a piece or thirty dollars a piece or whatever it is. You know, depending on how big the piece is and how complicated it is, they'll charge you a per piece um, amount. So. I think that if you're just starting, you're probably better to get somebody to do it or try the new technology, which allows you to do it all by yourself without having to invest in, because everyone's got a gas stove and you don't have to invest in a lot of really um, um, expensive equipment. Yeah. Okay. We just had a talk about it recently. Did you? Were you not for here for the talk? For the it's called new metals. You. Oh, okay, okay, the new metal. Are oh, you sorry, here? Sorry, yes, yes. Yeah, you were here. Yeah, <laughs> I remember yeah, you were here. So it was have, that one. Yeah, we have uh, one, one of one of the yeah. sessions that we do is all about how that technology it's works. So it's an yes. interesting one. So anyone who missed the new metals one, please stay tuned because come back and we got the new metals one coming up again. They're on a rotational basis, so we will be doing them uh, shortly. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Any more questions? Yes. What's the difference with sand casting? Sand casting. Yeah. So sand casting is fun. Um, it's you'd have to practice a lot to get very good results, and you're not going to get results generally that are really complex designs. So. With this kind of stuff, you can get really complex designs, but with sand casting, it's a very basic design because you've got to take a, a mold and then you've got to push it into the sand and then you've got to open, uh, you've got to check everything is really clean and nice and ready and then you have to put the two parts together and then you pour the, the metal in. So um, it works and it's really cheap because the sand is cheap and all you need is a a little handle that has a crucible and you heat up the metal in the crucible and just pour it in. Um, but how challenging is it to get really complex designs? Very challenging to get complex designs. But if it's just basic, basic stuff like a plain ring or, or something that uh, doesn't have a lot of form and shape to it, then it's okay. I mean, anything with little tiny prongs or settings or stuff like that, not a really good, not highly recommended. If it's a plain piece of metal with nothing, you know, protruding and nothing particular on it, then it will work. Right? A carving would be fine, but it would have to be a not too ornate carving. Yeah. We do have the sand, and uh, it, it's, it's, we've practiced with it a bit. There's another type of casting, which you might like to know about, and uh, is also quite fun. Um, it's called a cuttlefish. Um, casting. So that's where we take cuttlefish bones and cuttlefish bones amazingly can take a lot of heat. They take up to about 1,300 degrees heat. So what you do, you slice the cuttlefish uh, bone in half. When you open it up, it's very soft inside and you can carve into it. It's amazing how soft it is. The, the outside is hard, but the inside is soft. And uh, it has a very nice texture, a very interesting texture to it. But once you've done your carving, then you have, to, you have to carve a little hole through the top. And when you put it, place it back together and you bind it up with wire so that it stays closed. And then you have to put it next to some bricks and in a safe area where you can then pour the molten metal down into the closed piece, into the hole, so that it fills up the space that you carved. And you will get a very nice little thing. It's kind of... That, that is about the same as sand casting. So you can get, um, you can get you know, interesting shapes, you can get some textures, you can get certain things, 
but you're not going to get really intricate and ornate. You know, rings, for example, not the greatest thing with all kinds of settings and stuff for sand casting or cuttlefish casting. Yeah, but certainly cheap, 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 and I won't say easy, cheap and easy when you've had a lot of practice. Yeah. Great. Uh, I guess maybe last question from YouTube uh, is sandfish casting sandfish? Is sand casting and cuttlefish casting taught in our metalsmithing course? And the answer is no. Uh, the metalsmithing course is really more the hand fabrication. The casting part, not so relevant to working with the, the, the metals at the, very, when, at the very basic level. When we do the casting, it's in the um, MS 400, and we do. Uh, we're quite happy to do demonstrations on how the cuttlefish casting and the sand casting works. But the, the essence is the time. We don't have time for everybody to actually come and just play with it uh, because there isn't the time to do that. But we can show you how. We can also help you to understand what you're going to need and how you prepare your area to do it, um, which might be helpful. Um, but again, why do these old techniques, right? Because sand casting and even cuttlefish casting, they go back so far. You know, cuttlefish casting goes back to about 5000 BCE. And we don't even know who it was that one day woke up and said, I need a cuttlefish. I'm going to do some casting of metal, right? I mean, how did they know in those days? You know, it was before we even had writing. So um, we've no, no idea who invented it. But it's actually quite interesting that they did. But why do these old technologies, which are more dangerous today, than pick up a new technology that is faster and easier and you can do a lot more with it, basically? Great. Yes. So that brings us on to uh, our next question, which were, or next question, our next topic, which was if you wanted to learn more about these sorts of things, what would we recommend? And um, the first thing I would recommend perhaps is to get to know a little bit more about traditional metal smithing. Once you know more about working with the metals, then it makes more sense why you sometimes need casting or what you're going to do with the casting. Generally speaking, even if you know how to cast, you're not going to be able to finish a piece of jewelry unless you also know how to polish, also know how to work with the metals to, to be able to saw and to be able to you know, work with those different elements. So this is a very important kind of foundational um, set of skills that you need. If you're not really into hammering and sawing and soldering, then maybe another option would be going down the CAD route and then producing the waxes, where you can then simply have somebody else do the casting for you. You know about casting, but let them do the hard work of the casting and you just do the design work. Um, this is a great option, and uh, there are lots of ways to learn how to use the tools to be able to produce very accurate waxes. We also, for anybody that's interested to get into the gem and jewelry industry, have a fabulous course called Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets, which covers all the different gemstones, things like colored gemstones, diamonds, pearls, phenomenal gems, jade, organic gemstones, synthetics. It talks about the value factors, so you know what to look for and how to understand what's going to be more valuable and less valuable, uh, as well as a little bit about identification and about the synthetics and what's on the market so you can better um, understand your purchases uh, of gemstones, either for your designs or for your collection. Um, all of the courses that are taught here are taught by talented, expert, and practicing instructors. So these are people that are actively doing things in their own business, and then they're coming and sharing their passion with our students and our graduates. So I think that makes a really big difference to us, that we're not just sort of repeating stuff. Uh, we're doing stuff that we are, you know, this is, these are things that we do on a daily basis, and then we also share uh, with our students. And the Facilities where we do these are now in a very nice central location uh, at the National Design Center. We have a fabulous workshop. We have a great CAD classroom. Uh, we have uh, a variety of different spaces uh, to really make learning um, much more exciting and interesting. Um, the classes are small, so typically we have six to eight people in a class to make sure that everyone, especially for the hands-on classes, that everyone really understands uh, what they're learning and the classes are also all blended. 
What does blended mean? It means that part of the course is online and part of the course is in the classroom. This is becoming actually really valuable to us as we see that all of the stuff that we used to do all in a classroom and then we used to see people would come back the next week and forget. Now they have it and they can go back and see it again and they can make sure that they have it as a reference even after the course is finished. But they also have the luxury of coming into class, practicing, seeing what other people are doing, being inspired by what other people are doing and also learning from other people's mistakes, uh, being able to work with uh, you know, a group and really learn a lot more in a classroom environment. So we really like this blended learning format um, that works well for us. And for those of you that are then interested to go on, there are a couple of great options, either if you're interested in a career in jewelry or to do something more entrepreneurial. From a career prospect, we do uh, training for a lot of the big jewelry companies. We do training for their designers, we do training for their sales staff, we do training for their factory people, uh, we do training for their business owners. So uh, we really see a lot of what different jewelers are needing and wanting in the industry. And for those of you that are more entrepreneurial, we have the Creative Jewelry Studio, which is a great opportunity for you to have a place to start once you've started to make some pieces, how are you going to be able to get customers, meet other designers, find out where to source materials from. It's basically a really great community to meet up with other people who are actively doing the same thing and trying to grow their brand and their business. All of the courses are um, Skills Future um, uh, supported, which means that you can get a training grant for up to 70% of the course fees if you are a Singaporean or a permanent resident. And if you are a Singaporean and you have Skills Future credits, you can also use your Skills Future credits to pay the balance amount of those course fees. And with that, I would like to say thank you to everybody from YouTube. Thanks all for joining us. And those of you that are physically here, just stay on 